message title today, which you probably can't see, is hope. The under subtitle of that is, is there any hope when I'm afraid? Is there any hope while I'm afraid? This is a third part of a four-part series we've been doing on hope. So our first message, I wasn't here, there was another pass here, but I spoke about hope for the broken heart. Last week we spoke about, um, is there hope when I've messed up? Story of Jesus Christ and his disciples walking through Samaria, and they get to a place called Sikar, and there the disciples go into the town, and Jesus sits at the well, and there he's visited by a lady, a lady who's made some bad decisions in life. She's had bad relationship problems. She was messed up. And I say in a quiet conversation with this lady that Jesus offers her forgiveness and hope even when she's messed up. So today we're going to look at the big question, which is, is there any hope when I'm afraid? And let's be honest, we've all got fears. We've all got phobias. There's all things we're scared about. Some of the things aren't even real, yet whether or not they tricks of the mind, we still have a real fear. Millions of people suffer with this. I heard this funny story about this one guy that overcame his fear of the devil. It was a church service much like ourselves. Everything was going smoothly when all of a sudden there was a flash of light, a puff of smoke and a big bang. And when the smoke went away, there was the devil in front of the pulpit in his iconic outfit, red, two horns, pitchfork and tail. You know, the devil. And everybody in the church got up and ran for the doors, scrambling to try and get out the doors. Everyone was very scared of the devil except for one guy in the front pew, acting like he wasn't even bothered by all of this. So the devil looks at the guy and says, do you know who I am? He says, yeah, sure do. He says, well, aren't you afraid? Don't you fear me? And the man says, nope. The devil says, well, why not? He says, for what? I've been married to your sister for 35 years. <laughs> Some of the husbands are nudging their wives. <laughs> it's only 35 years. Um, so apparently there are things more scary than the devil. <laughs> and the husbands are all nodding. Uh, we all struggle with fear from time to time and phobias. Today we're going to do something different. Normally I, I like narrative sermons, which is I look at stories in the Bible, stories of Jesus, and I try to give you the story of it and just explain it to you. Today we're going to look at more of a topical view. We're going to look at fear itself as a topic. Look at understanding fear and overcoming fear. And for that, we're going to go right to the Old Testament. We're going to look at a psalm of David, Psalm 55. So let's turn to Psalm 55. And if you don't have your Bibles, we'll read it on the screen. It says this from verses 1. Listen to my prayer. This is a psalm of David. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught because of what my enemy is saying. Because of the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me and assail me in anger. You can just listen to the tone of his voice as I'm reading this. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling. Everybody say fear. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. And I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to a place of shelter far from the tempest and the storm. So as I said before, we're going to look at two things. Uh, first one is understanding fear. What exactly is fear? According to the dictionary, fear is a feeling. So it's a feeling, first of all, it's an emotional feeling of anxiety caused by the presence of imminent danger. Sound, it sounds good. It's, it's, that's what it says. So it means that you have a, a fear, a apprehension. You, got, you get anxious about something because something is happening right now in front of you that could cause your hurt or harm. So that's what fear is. Do you know the word fear comes from a Greek word phobia, where we get our word phobia. Well done. Do you know that there's over 500 different phobias registered by the Medical Association? Over 500 different phobias and fears. For example, this one which is called cyberphobia. It's a fear of computers, a fear of technology. So a person with this fear won't be able to use his cell phone because he's got a fear of it. What about lunar phobia, a fear of the moon? Not only the moon, but also the moonlight. Can you imagine being afraid of the moon? There's one called astrophobia, fear of lightning and thunder. Who's afraid of the thunder? Put up your hands. Only Dirk, Dirk Shame, eh? Oh, you do. <laughs> So you and Dirk, yeah, some people are scared of the thunder, but it's not only the thunder, it's the lightning as well. That scares people. He has one called krematophobia. Kremato comes from the Greek word kremati, which is money. The fear of money. Let me just tell you what you already know. Women do not have this phobia. 
All right, no woman will ever have it. They don't even understand what this is. They have a fear of not having money. That's what their fear is. Eh? Fear of money. Here's one that maybe I've got a fear of. It's, it's called pallidophobia. The fear of going bald. I can see some of you already passed it. Choo! Eh? Johnny, me and you. It's not that I've got a fear of going bald. I just don't want to go bald. That's basically it. I don't have a fear about it. There's one more, and this... Um, this one's actually called phobophobia. Believe it or not, there's actually something called phobophobia, which is a fear of fear. So as if there's nothing worse than other fears. This is someone that's scared of being scared of all the other scary things out there in the world. So I don't know how this person lives. He must live in a dark room in his house and never, ever go out. <laughs> He's got a fear of fear. All right. And one of the, the biggest ones that people commonly deal with is glossophobia, the fear of public speaking. So what I'd like to do now is just call five people up randomly. I want to call five random people up. I'll start with, you know, who. no, I'm not going to do that. The quickest way to test us, call five of you up, stand up here and start talking. The ones that pass out, you've got the fear. That's how I figure it. That's how bad it is. Claustrophobia, the fear of public speaking. Um, Jerry Seinfeld, you all know Jerry Seinfeld. He is a famous comedian. He said this, he says, studies show that the number one fear amongst people is public speaking. Number two fear is death. So if you're at a funeral, you would rather be in the casket than given the eulogy. Did you get them? I'll say it again. <laughs> so that's how bad the fear is, that people would rather actually be dead. And I've seen this in funerals. You know, before the funeral, I prep the, the family, and we go through the letters and the eulogies, and we pick out who's going to say what. Come that day of the funeral, nobody wants to stand up and speak. It's almost like, no, no, Raymond, you do it. And then here comes all the Afrikaans letters that I must try and pronounce, which I can't. All right, so this is a real, real definite fear. We all suffer from this fears. All of us have different ones. Mine, I've got two. I'm afraid of heights. That's why God made me small and short. Because if I was any taller, I'd... Uh, strange enough, I can be in an airplane. I can fly airplanes. and I've even been in a helicopter. But I can't go... If I had to get onto this roof, I, I get very, very anxious. Same as my other fear is spiders. Oh, who's with, with me with this one? Put up your hand. Oh, Joel... I just wish that Noah could have made an accident on the thing and just, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> and just let like, the, the male just run around. I hate those devilish things that are from hell. I, I don't mind insects, insects, the, the, the six-legged little grasshoppers and lizards. I'm down with all of those things. But come the eight legs and I literally freeze up. I'm actually getting anxious thinking about looking at a spider right now. That's how bad it is. I can't even look at a picture of it, you know. I heard today for the first time that the way to overcome this is every day you must look at a picture of a spider. I won't even get that far. <laughs> they say that the way to get over it is just once a day just to look at a photograph of a spider and then the next day do it again. And over like maybe six or seven years, maybe you'll overcome your fear. I don't care. I'm not going to look at any spider anywhere. In my house, if there's any spider, my wife does a killing. I will not sleep in that house until she has got the broom and she goes around killing all the spiders. <laughs> no matter how big they are, I don't care. But that's my fear. So let's understand a bit more about fear. The, 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 there's only two points to this understanding fear. The one is that there is a healthy fear that protects you. Believe it or not, God has hardwired us with, with something in our brains that actually protects us. So, for example, when you cross the road, you look right and left. And the reason you do that is because you have a fear of a car hitting you and being killed, right? When you see a snake, what does, you'll see a snake and immediately what will happen, you'll get scared of it and you'll hopefully run away or at least try and kick it or something or stab it or something, all right? So that's a real good fear. It's a good fear that God has given you to protect you, to help you, all right? And in your brain is this little thing called the amygdala, the amygdala. It's a small little thing but this big. It's responsible for fear. So when you get scared, you see a snake, the amygdala kicks into full gear, it releases adrenaline into your body, which gives you the ability then to run away or to fight. All right? I am not a fighter. I'm a runner. Anything that scares me, I run for the yield. I'm not going to fight anybody or anything. All right? Snake, spider, or person. So that's what happens. God gave us the thing that's in our brains to protect us. It's a good thing. But the problem with the amygdala is it's not objective which means its only function, its only responsibility is to make you run away. It can't reason through it, can't, no logic. The thing that what has to work with the amygdala is your prefrontal cortex. Have you heard of that before? It's the front of the brain. It's very easy. <laughs> it's this section. This section of your brain 
is there for reasoning, for logic. So if you ever hit this part of your brain, it's going to really, really affect you. You won't be able to reason right or have any logic. So what happens was amygdala works with this part. So for example, in the middle of the night, you hear a bang and you get scared. The amygdala kicks in and it says, run, hide, danger, you are going to die. But then your prefrontal cortex kicks in and says, just hang on, hang on, just relax. It's probably the cat. And then the prefrontal cortex says again, what am I going to do with that cat when I find it? Something I should have done a long, long time ago. All right, so your amygdala is a good thing. It's there to protect you from harm. But it's got to work with the frontal cortex of your brain because that's the part that reasons about it. So there is actually a fear that's good for you. And this is the first one. There is also one that's not good for you. And that is simply a harmful fear that paralyzes you. Um, when this amygdala kicks in, it releases an adrenaline into your body that makes you either fight. Everyone say fight. So the F or flee. Everyone say flee. Two Fs. So those are good. But the harmful one is one that freezes you. It paralyzes you. The same feeling I get when I see a spider. I can't do anything. I just look at it and I start shaking, <laughs> waiting for somebody to come past and do that. So that's a, a harmful one that actually paralyzes you and freezes you. Believe it or not, Julius Caesar was like the ruler of the Roman Republic. He was scared of thunder. This was a guy that ruled the Roman Empire, yet he was afraid of thunder, so much so that he would hide under his bed. His guards used to look and say, you're crazy, what are you doing under your bed? You like rule the Roman Empire, what's the matter with you? An irrational fear that paralyzed him. There was another guy called Peter the Great, the feared Russian Tsar. He was afraid of bridges. Anybody else afraid of bridges? Never heard of that. He, even in wartime, he would not cross the bridge. He would go to the bridge and just freeze up. And his armies were thinking, now what? What do we do now? And they'll probably lose the war because he couldn't cross the bridge. So there is a fear out there, a harmful one that paralyzes us. And makes you freeze. And it's this harmful one that steals your joy. You can't move forward in life because this one is holding you back. Understand if you're frozen, you cannot move forward. This fear is not only one that's physical, it's emotional and spiritual. It's a fear that freezes you to the point that you've lost your joy, you've lost your peace, and you can't move forward in life and you can't move forward with God. This is a fear that we need to overcome. So let's look at our second point, which is overcoming fear. We're going to look at three areas. Three areas where David says in Psalm 55, things that we are scared of. The first one is, are you afraid of bad people? Who's afraid of bad people out there? I am because I'm short. I'm always afraid of bad people. Let's read what it says in Psalm 55. Are you afraid of bad people? This is a fear of bad people. It says this in verses 2 and 3. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me and I'm distraught because of what my enemy is saying, because of the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me and assail me in their anger. Do you notice he's talking about his enemies? He's talking about bad people out there. 3,000 years from then, things have not changed. There's still wicked, bad people out there. I call them bullies. I don't know about you, but I, I was bullied in school because you can look at me now. I wasn't always tall, dark, and handsome. There was a time, what are you laughing at, Gail? Blondie. There was a time when I was actually really short and I was picked on a lot. So I, I, not only was I picked on, which grew my hatred for bullies, but this happened throughout my life. And even in, in workplaces, in churches, you get bullies everywhere. It doesn't just stop when you at, in primary school. It goes through to high school, it goes through to college, it goes through to your school. Wherever you go, there will always be bullies. And, 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 and because I was bullied, I just, I don't like bullies. You know, everyone who knows me knows that I love most people. You know, it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, I love all of you, but not bullies. All right? What I would like to do with the bullies, especially those in school, is to take them into a dark corner for counseling. And when I say counseling, I mean beat them with the Bible. All right? That's what I want to do with them. Because I, I, I see them when they bully other people and these kids, and it just and it riles me up. There's one thing that riles me up. It's a bigger kid beating up a younger kid, and especially because I've been there. So there's always going to be these wicked kids. The spirit's moving today, people. <laughs> the spirit's moving. I'm <laughs> slating the spirit all of you. Today we, we, suffer, we suffer with another kind of bullying, cyberbullying. Um, on TikTok and WhatsApp and all of that, and, and, and it's actually bad. We don't understand that. From you know, my age up, we, we don't understand what cyberbullying is, but it's such a big thing today. Uh, there's teenagers who have killed themselves, committed suicide over what somebody has sent them, 
and, and shame their name or pictures on WhatsApp and social media like Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of it. We didn't have to deal with that. So today we deal with a whole different kind of bully. Back in David's day, he had a big bully, a big giant named? No, not Saul. Goliath, who said Saul? <laughs> he was tall, yes. Do you know that Saul was the tallest man in the Bible? Anybody know that? Head and shoulders above everyone else. But I'm talking about Goliath. There was a time when this young, strapping, good-looking chap called David, he was about 18 or 19 years old, he had to fight against this giant called Goliath. And here was Goliath, hurling his insults against the Israelites and against the, the God Yahweh and saying all these bad things. He was a bully. All right? And here David steps up. And as people have this idea that David was like this 12-year-old kid running around the swing show, I don't think so. I think David at this time was a young body bull of a strapping young handsome man about 18 or 19 years old the bible says that at that point he had already killed a lion and a bear i don't see a 12 year old kid killing anything let alone a lion and a bear so i think by the time he got to this goliath oak he was ready he was ready for a fight and goliath picked a fight with the wrong guy this day and david says to him you come to me with a spear and a sword and a javelin i come to you in the name of the lord god almighty one of the most inspirational speeches, just that one line. He says, you can come with whatever you got, sticks and stones, means nothing. Throw your spears and javelins. I'm here with God, and if God is on my side, there is no way that you are going to win this battle. Notice, where did his strength lie? In himself? No. In God. In God Almighty, always going to be. That fight wasn't David and Goliath. It was God and Goliath. It's the same for you and I. You might think you're overcoming your battles, but it's not. It's God that gives you the strength and he'll give you the victory too. It's the same for David and Goliath. You know how David actually won the victory of his enemies? Let me read it to you. He gives us the antidote. And this is in verse 17. He says, every morning and noon I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. Pray. Notice, is it only 10 minutes in the morning? No. Is it only before you go to bed, just before you put your pillow on the bed? Who's, who, who prays like that? Who prays with the head on the pillow? Heaven in hell. Hey, don't do that. All right? I've done it myself many times. It doesn't work. All right? I don't get past heavenly father. You've got to be praying all through the day. That's all praise. It's talking to God. If you've got a relationship with God, it's the same as a relationship with another person. With your wife, your spouse, your partner, whoever it is, your mother, your father, your daughter, your son. You're continually talking with him through the day. It's the same with your relationship with God. You know, David could have come to God at this time when he's fighting Goliath and said, God, I need you. And uh, can you imagine God saying, and who are you again? When is the last time you spoke to me? Because some Christians are like that. We only come to God in times of crisis. We don't talk to him for the whole year. But God forbid if you get sick. It's the first thing you do. You call upon God. Maybe God must look at you too and say, who are you again? When was the last time we spoke? I don't remember you. If you want to overcome your enemies and the bad people out there, overcome your fear of them, you have to get in a regular rapport with God, a relationship that you can talk to him. The Bible says very clearly the confidence is that he hears you. He doesn't always answer affirmatively, but God always hears you. So let's look at our second point. That's being afraid of bad people. Are you afraid of the future? I want to read just one verse. It says, my thoughts trouble me and I am distort. Who's afraid of the future? Yeah? Man, we're looking up at the politics coming up and we don't know what, about the elections and we don't know who to choose there. Uh, uh, the worst of two evils, I see it. And, and you know, we don't know the, the wars overseas in Gaza and Israel and Ukraine and the petrol going up. It's, just, it's all bad out there. So if you say you're not afraid of the future, I'd probably say you're lying. There is a limit to all of us having a little bit of a fear of the future. You know what? You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid for our children and our grandchildren. Because let's be honest, guys, my age and up, we've had our life. We had a, uh, from now on, we just look in heaven with. And, and you know, even if the future's bad, we, we've had our time. I'm, I'm worried about our children and grandchildren. They got to grow up in this world. They got to grow up in this country. They got to grow up in a world that is so out of control in chaos and torment. Do you remember the good old days when me and you could play outside till like eight, nine o'clock at night? Hey, Ronnie, you remember those good old days? And you should come home. Your parents didn't even care where you were. You could have run down the street naked. They wouldn't mind. It was just the way things were. You played with your kids, you, your friends. You came home at 9, 10 o'clock at night. And the doors wouldn't be locked. The windows would be open. You didn't have to lock your car. Nowadays, if you don't bolt something down, it's going to be stolen. 
You know, uh, before we moved to P, I lived in Baines, and uh, the, the street I lived in had all these high walls, like six-foot walls, barbed wire around them. It had the cameras, CCTV, at the signs. The kids are prisoners in their own homes. The parents, and I don't blame the parents. The parents don't want to allow their kids out because of the criminal element out there, because of the pedophiles, because of the traffickers, because of all these bad things. So it's not that I blame the parents, but what kind of world are we living in when a child cannot go outside and play a game of cricket? In my street, you know what I used to do with my kids? I used to go outside, even during COVID, believe it or not. I used to go outside and my kids, my two kids, and I used to play a bit of cricket there in the driveway. And you know what happened is some of the kids, in the, the, they used to peek over the walls because they heard a commotion. They used to peek over the six-foot walls and see me playing cricket with my kids. And they say, hey, can Ons come spill song? And then they used to jump over the walls, and then we had about a, a, a 10 kids in the neighborhood playing cricket with us, just for about 10 or 15 minutes, because God forbid did their parents find out. Come, you come later, you get a slate up, and you eat, eat, all the alarms are on again. Can you believe it? That's the world we live in, when kids can't even walk the streets, can't play a game of cricket outside. Are you afraid of the future? Yes, I am afraid of the future. But there's a limit to that. A limit to that, because the Bible actually gives us a very beautiful promise in 2 Timothy. It says this, for God has not given us a spirit of what? But of? Look at a person next to you and say power, because that is the spirit that God has given us. He has not given us a spirit of fear. That comes from the devil. He wants to intimidate. He wants to scare. He wants to keep you anxious. God is not, God has given us a, what? A spirit of? power and of love and a sound mind. That's a God we serve. If we serve a God that created the universe that gave us this spirit of power, what are we afraid of? As I said, naturally you can be afraid of the future. But with God on your side, you don't have to fear the future. I always said that, don't fear what the future holds, because you know who holds the future. And that's God. And the Bible says this, one more antidote from uh, David, he says simply this, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. That's you and I, we're the righteous. We'll never be shaken in fear. Why? Because we can just cast our cares upon him. Some of us aren't doing that today. We need to cast our cares upon the Lord and say, I am anxious about this. I am worried. I am fearful for the future. But I'm giving you this anxiety, Lord. I'm giving you this fear and you take it. Cast means to throw far away. So you are here. And basically where Pat is, you throw in your fears and you throw in all your cares that far to where God is. That's the antidote for being afraid of the future. Let's look at our last one. Are you afraid of dying? Whoa. Let's read one verse in closing. It says this, my heart is in anguish within me. The terror of death has fallen on me. Uh, this one is a common one with all people. Um, all cultures, all religions, all believe in an afterlife. Do you know that? I mean, it's only the atheists that don't believe in an afterlife. And it's a minority, so we don't worry about them. But all cultures, all religions believe that when we die, we're going to go somewhere. All of them believe that when they die, if they're good, they'll go to a good place. And if they're bad, they'll go to a bad place. The same as Christians. We all have that same um, afterlife. There's even Christians that still fear what happens after we die. I heard this funny story, just in closing quick, about this preacher that was trying to impress upon his congregation that they're all going to die. Just stating the fact, like I've just said. It's, a, it's like death in Texas. It's always going to be there. So he looked at his congregation and said, every member of this church is going to die. There was a kid in the front seat, yeah, in the front pew, he started laughing his head off. So the pastor said again, even loud, he said, every member of this church is going to die. The little kid laughed even louder. The pastor stopped and said, young man, what are you laughing about? He replied and said, I'm not a member of this church. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or not. You are going to die. And I'll say that sincerely. <laughs> Maybe not today or tomorrow or next week. But all of us on this planet, Hebrews says that it's appointed for men once to die and then the judgment. All of us on this planet will eventually come to an end. For you and I as Christians, there is hope because of what Jesus Christ has done for us when he died on that cross. He died to give you the hope that when you die on this world, you will open your eyes and you will be in a better place.
That's called heaven. That's what God has given us. There will be no sin, no disease, no sickness, no tears, no nothing. It will just be joy and peace in the presence of Almighty God. That is our hope. We have never to fear dying. And I've been at the deathbed of some people. You can see the fear in their eyes. You know that? You can see it. You can sense it on their bodies because they don't know where they're going. They don't have this assurance that Jesus has died for them, that he has opened up the gates of heaven, and they're scared. They don't even want to die because they don't know what's going to happen. I've administered the last rites at many a deathbed, and that's what the last rites is. It's those people that fear death because they don't know Jesus. The last rites is simply me telling them, this is it, buddy. You've got to make the decision now. Are you going to believe in him or not? Forgiveness awaits you. For you and I as Christians, our hope lies not in what we've done, but in what Jesus Christ already done for us 2,000 years ago. When he died and shed his blood, that was the blood that forgives us of your sins. And that is the blood that opens up the doorway to heaven. We need not fear dying because Jesus already died for us. The good news is he rose again to offer us that eternal life. Amen? Amen. Let me close with one more verse. It's a beautiful verse. It's the last one. It says this. This is still David, and he, he concludes his story of fear and overcoming fear with this. He says, I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and the storm. If only I had wings of a dove. Anybody ever feel like that sometimes at all the worries and problems and troubles and fears? We just wish, God, just give us wings so we can just rise above it and just fly away from the fears. Fly away from the storms. And you've probably heard it say that you don't run from your fears, but you run towards them. I think that's wrong. You don't run from your fears. You don't run to them. You run to God. That's where you run. You need not run away or to them. You run to God with those fears. The Bible says you talk to him regularly, like David did. You cast your cares upon him. And he will sustain you. The righteous won't be shaken, shaken and quivering in fear because if God is with you, who can be against you? We need those wings of a dove and we need to fly towards Jesus because it's him. That's where our shelter lies. That's where our peace lies. Away from the storms in the presence and peace of God Almighty. Are you afraid today? Jesus offers you hope even when you are afraid. Amen.